Good morning, friends. Welcome to the CEC Edusit Live Lecture. Dear friends, with our ongoing series on women and history, today we would be talking on women and education in colonial India. And for this discussion, we have once again with us in our studios Dr. Shruti Vip. Dr. Shruti Vip is Assistant Professor in Department of History, PG DAV Evening College, University of Delhi. So let's welcome our guest, Dr. Shruti Vip, and let's try to understand the topic in detail women and education in colonial India. Hello ma'am, welcome to the Hello, Lecture. Thank you. Uh, welcome friends. Uh, today as uh, Geetika just uh, told you, we are going to talk about how education developed during the colonial period. Uh, this is not to say that uh, there was no education uh, before the Britishers came, but we are specifically going to discuss what was the impact of colonial regime on the education of women. Uh, well, uh, we all know that how education sector has expanded today and numerically the higher uh, Indian education system is one of the largest in the world with almost with more than 659 universities out of which uh, only around six are women's university and approximately uh, 4,500 women's colleges out of more than 35,000 undergraduate colleges. So definitely there is a need to understand as to why while women constitute 50% of the population, uh, their access to educational institutions is still limited in numbers. Also, uh, it is important to understand that a modern education for women in India began in the early years of the 19th century and by the 1880s universities had started admitting them. So it is not as if uh, uh, women were admitted to universities only after independence. The pro process had started much earlier, but uh, the fact remains that serious gaps remain between male and female enrollment patterns. A number of surveys were conducted by colonial administrators uh, in order to understand the exact situation of education in India so that they could devise ways and means to cope with the problem. As a result, a number of surveys were conducted by Thomas Munro in Madras in 1822, then Stuart and Elphinstone in Bombay 1823, then William Adam in Bangalore and Bihar 1835, and then in Punjab in 1849. And after these surveys, what Britishers came uh, to realize that an extensive indigenous system of child education definitely existed uh, even though it was primarily at the primary level and uh, the advent of British rule in India was definitely going to be a great challenge to the existing educational institutions because it was not only the philosophy of education that was different. Uh, uh, the Indian educational system that was prevalent before the colonial regime was completely different with its focus on different subjects, philosophies, etc. as compared to the subjects and the curriculum that were introduced by the colonial masters. Then uh, the British emphasis on the setting up of government schools based on English medium instruction mainly in urban centers uh, had an ad adverse impact on the indigenous village based schools. So definitely it was a major change that came about which was increasingly being felt in the course of 19th 20th centuries. Then uh, uh, coming to the introductory aspect of our topic, uh, the progress of education among women was quite slow until 1921. Though the colonial masters had started devising ways and means, uh, they had started uh, analyzing policies, implementing policies by the end of uh, uh, 19th centuries and 20th century, even by the end of 18th century, some kind of realization had dawned upon as to uh, the need to uh, revise education system in India. But still, uh, a, a very positive impact uh, as far as women were concerned was not immediately felt. Uh, 
And even as late as 1931, 92% of the Indian population remained illiterate. And the number of students who were studying in higher educational institutions in 1942 was merely 0.5% of the population and the percentage of women was even lesser. Uh, another great anomaly was that there was no technical education for women per se and uh, uh, definitely there were some exceptions in this otherwise gloomy picture. For example, uh, Hansa, Me uh, uh, Hansa Ben Mehta as early as 1946 uh, not only became a vice chancellor but could also make outstanding contributions to the development of education in India. But then these were exceptions. Uh, and despite consistent increase in the number of women students uh, who were enrolled in higher education, uh, uh, there has been a very low number of women in academic positions, especially at leadership level. And this fact remains to this date. So definitely uh, a, a discussion on the progress of education uh, can help us in understanding the ways and means and the strategies that can be devised even today uh, in order to meet the challenges of uh, lesser women uh, at uh, top leadership and managerial positions in educational institutions. Hence, the relevance of the topic is uh, definitely uh, qu uh, quite a lot. Uh, also, uh, it is important to understand that higher education system in India essentially reflects uh, masculine traits. Uh, so the same masculinity that we had discussed uh, in course of uh, uh, my lectures earlier when we were discussing 19th century reform movements, we would be focusing on uh, that uh, today also as to how the education system that was devised in the colonial period had definite masculine traits, uh, many of which are continuing till date. Uh, so there was both a vertical as well as a horizontal segregation in terms of gender and this remains a persistent phenomenon. Uh, coming to the linkages between colonialism and education, uh, education of Indians had become a great matter of concern for uh, the colonial officers, administrators, uh, even the British Parliament. Uh, because uh, the, the, the education policy's goal was not only to advance knowledge of Indians or hardly that was the goal, they never uh, were bothered whether Indians were knowledgeable or not, but definitely their concern was to create a class of employable Indians so that uh, they could uh, cheaply engage them and uh, pay them much lesser wages and get their work done. Uh, all the essential work could not be handed over, all the clerical jobs could not be handed over to the white men. So therefore, uh, it was a prime concern for English East India Company to devise a new education policy in India, keeping in mind the concerns of the Raj. Uh, the needs of the British Raj were always uh, the prime mover in devising any kind of policy, whether it was related to education or economy or uh, uh, science and technology, etc. So uh, uh, the prime mover was definitely the political and administrative as well as the economic needs of British India. And the expanding empire in India uh, definitely needed a well-trained, well-equipped, educated manpower, well-versed in English. So as to uh, 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 better convey to the masses the necessity of remaining subservient to the British rule. Uh, as has been pointed out by A.R. Desai, uh, there were a number of reasons for the introduction of English education for Indians. Uh, 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 as has been stated by him, the various educational institutions uh, uh, that were started by Britishers not only provided clerks for the government and the commercial offices, uh, but also lawyers well versed in the process of the colonial regime, as well as the new legal system that had been introduced by the Britishers in India, as well as doctors who 
were trained in modern medical science, technicians and teachers. So uh, definitely this kind of uh, limited modernity was required if the colonial uh, Raj had to sustain itself uh, in India successfully. Uh, coming to the uh, uh, other arguments that have been uh, put forward by uh, A.R. Desai, uh, uh, he has pointed out that how the anglicizing program uh, that was suggested by uh, the enlightened Britishers had its own agenda behind it and uh, it uh, advocated uh, education in oriental knowledge in Sanskrit and Persian only to the lower strata of uh, 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 population and also at the lower level of education. So the Anglicists were convinced that the British culture was the best and the most liberated in the world and the higher education must be imparted in that. And all those Indians who would imbibe those British values and English education would themselves help in influencing rest of the masses who could continue getting education in whatever language and whatever they, they were. So uh, when India and other colonies, they all would be uh, imparted education in English, what would be the end result? The end result would definitely be a political unification of the world under the mother country that is the Great Britain. Uh, a very important uh, benchmark uh, that must be discussed here when one is talking about uh, education policy uh, during the colonial period was the Macaulay's Minute. Macaulay in his famous minutes dated 2nd February 1835 uh, commented that uh, the Britishers must do their best to create a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern. That means between the Britishers, between the colonial masters and the Indians. And uh, by doing so, a class of persons who would be Indian in blood and in intellect would be created. But that very class would be English in tastes, morals, intellect values, opinions, etc. So basically, uh, they thought that by providing English education to the handful, they would be able to manipulate their culture, their beliefs, practices and gradually a change would definitely come about in the larger society also. Uh, so, uh, it was to that class of educated Indians uh, that uh, 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 the the process of education educating rest of the indians could be uh, assigned and uh, uh, according to uh, the colonial masters and particularly macaulay who was devising this new strategy uh, it was not a moral responsibility of the uh, british rule to educate each and every Indian in the new uh, kind of uh, education system or, or to introduce uh, it for all categories of Indians because that according to him was not only impractical but also not required because this job could very well be done by the handful of educated Indians who would be uh, spreading this knowledge through their own lifestyle, through, the, through their own changed persona. Uh, so, as a result, uh, 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 the process of uh, a very segregated kind of education system started henceforth and this continues till date when we definitely have a huge gap between the English educated Indians uh, and those who are not well versed with the language as well as the new education system, particularly the private universities. Now, as has been pointed out by Krishna Kumar, uh, this uh, new education system, uh, 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 while the idea was that the British introduced modern education to train clerks, uh, but Krishna Kumar says that uh, this is not exactly what happened. And uh, Krishna Kumar writing in 1985 and 2005 kind of challenged this uh, uh, ideology and he considered it as a theoretically feeble 
argument because according to him what happened eventually was not only that a class of educated clerks who were the supporters who were the bulwarks of the Raj uh, uh, that they emerged but alternately what emerged was a class of Indians who after getting education who after getting exposed to the Western liberal ideas of democracy, liberalism, freedom, equality, liberty, fraternity, they started questioning the very uh, uh, philosophy of subservience, the very idea of uh, 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 you know, continuing as uh, slaves and the very idea of colonialism. And the first opposition to the British rule definitely uh, uh, came, uh, though in uh, very moderate uh, uh, terminology, from this educated Indian middle class. So, uh, according to Krishna Kumar, uh, modern Indian education not only produced clerks, but also produced nationalist leaders, uh, professionals and intellectuals who started questioning the colonial ideology and this also was a very important impact and contribution of the new education system that was devised by Britishers. Uh, the complex and multifaceted influence of the colonial education on Indian society can be a very interesting uh, uh, a point of reference and uh, this also proves that no simple model or statement or idea can help us understand as to why colonial education had the kind of divergent effects it had on Indian population. Uh, so, uh, the broader rejection of colonial rule was also directly or indirectly linked to the new uh, education system that had been introduced. Now, coming to the characteristics of colonial education system, it is very important to analyze the characteristics of colonial education system so as to discuss uh, as to what went beyond uh, and how women kind of fared in this system. So, while the colonial institutions were unresponsive to the needs of Indians, uh, uh, it was also imperative that Besides colonialism, uh, uh, one understands what was the impact of new education system on poverty, social inequalities, gender relations, the quality and the functioning of schooling system. And overall, what was the reason behind the continuation of the low literacy rate, which again was a major problem and continues till this date. As a result, the levels of enrollment in higher education remained minimal and this also was uh, 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 the reason, uh, uh, this was uh, primarily the result of a very selective kind of myopic uh, higher education policy that had been devised by uh, the Woods Dispatch. Then uh, 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 education largely catered to the needs of the colonial administration. So, therefore, a very limited kind of education uh, uh, with no great emphasis on technical or modern uh, or medical or science and technology based education was uh, uh, really uh, encouraged. Then, uh, coming to the aspect of uh, 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 how a a very lopsided kind of manpower was uh, being developed uh, who would not be sufficiently trained or equipped to challenge the very idea of being ruled by the colonial administrators also became a reality and it also kind of hampered the economic development of the country. So, the higher educational institutions concentrated only in the port cities. Uh, 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 of uh, Kolkata and uh, uh, Madras, M uh, Bombay, uh, uh, because these were the areas that had been initially colonized by the Britishers and uh, uh, definitely uh, it was Calcutta which became a, a center of uh, English education uh, in the beginning. Uh, then the socio-economic base of education also remained quite low. Uh, 
uh, it was not definitely for the masses and education while it was evaluated on the basis of teaching but not on the basis of learning. So the learning outcome definitely was not uh, 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 any, uh, it was not a source of judgment and uh, therefore a very limited kind of influence could be uh, experienced. Uh, also, the weak base for knowledge accumulation remained a persistent problem and this also continues till date because the base remained weak. So therefore, uh, uh, as students progressed from uh, primary to uh, secondary or higher education, the, because of this weakness in the base, the problems persisted and this problem also can be experienced in our education system today, particularly in the government funded institutions. So, uh, 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 what needs to be explained is uh, this dichotomy between tradition and modernity and how uh, women and education kind of uh, uh, emerged out of this paradigm. So, while on the one hand, uh, the colonial state from the Hunter Commission report uh, onwards and even before that highlighted that how Indians were backward because they were not educating their women and uh, the Hunter Commission pointed out uh, this gravity and also declared that how important it was to educate women in India in order to bring about a positive change in society. But on the other hand, there was no systematic effort um, on the part of the colonial state to rectify this situation and to uh, uh, make positive changes uh, in uh, society uh, and also to create specific educational institutions who would help women surmount their socio-cultural barriers. So no such thought was put into practice and the state considered uh, this the domain of Indian men. So they were kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 trying to convince Indian men that uh, it is they who should think about their women folk and it is they who should now start educating their women without initiating, uh, um, you know, practical uh, policies and programs uh, while they were very well the uh, administrative and colonial masters of India. Uh, a very important aspect in this entire process of women education uh, 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 during 19th century was the fear of educated women. So while on the one hand there was now a, a realization that women ought to be educated, at the same time an educated m woman was uh, 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 someone who, who would be feared by the family, by the society and there were many uh, notions and misconceptions that were being edu uh, attached to uh, uh, the image of an educated woman. So again, uh, one comes across a dichotomy when a woman's education was seen as a measure of modernity. If a woman was educated, then definitely she was modern. Uh, she was good for uh, the family. Uh, but the opposite also was happening. And as has been pointed out by Partha Chatterjee, the, uh, during the colonial period, uh, the public realm was described as male, materialistic and modern while the private realm uh, uh, emerged as a place of tradition, spirituality embodied in the woman of the house. So this public-private dichotomy further hampered the cause of women's education because uh, uh, as nationalism progressed and as nationalism uh, adopted a very uh, belligerent uh, stance towards uh, 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 the, their rulers and they kind of uh, uh, adopted a more rigid stand against the British uh, uh, lawmaking process. Uh, they uh, also, this also resulted in a hardening of stance uh, towards uh, the modernizing project that was being talked about by the Britishers as well as by some educated Indians. Now, this also explains the fear 
that the figure of the modern educated woman provoked in uh, most circles. So uh, she was now usually portrayed, an educated woman was usually portrayed as one who violated or mocked traditions. So this uh, quote unquote hesitation to accept uh, uh, an educated woman in the household became a reality during the colonial period. So uh, now this fear instilled, instigated a number of questions about whether women should be educated and how much education should be imparted and what should be the content of that education. Now this content aspect became very important because according to various uh, educationists, uh, reformers, thinkers, uh, it was of no use to teach subjects like uh, geography or uh, mathematics or science to women. Uh, what women needed was at best home science related subjects which would help them uh, uh, look after their houses in a better way, maintain hygiene, uh, and also train their, uh, you know, uh, their children to be uh, uh, good uh, 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 and morally strong individuals. So, a uh, kind of education that would not impact the traditional roles of women was supported. Uh, so, uh, we have uh, many women educationists also uh, during this colonial period like uh, Mataji Tapaswini in 1893 who established the Mahakali Patshala in Calcutta which taught a curriculum in traditional rites, beliefs, uh, practices as well as uh, you know, uh, home science related subjects like sewing and cooking uh, as the most important part of curriculum that had to be uh, instilled in young girls. Uh, Gail Minolt, writing in 1998, said that the efforts of Muslim reformers to tackle the question of women's education also progressed in a peculiar direction. So, a new genre of novels like Maulana Thanvi's uh, Behishti Zewar or Nazir Ahmed's Mirat ul Arus, uh, which outlined the qualities of the educated woman, uh, 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 came out and uh, they were kind of uh, quite popular among. Uh, uh, the women readers. But here also these novels emphasized on uh, uh, how, uh, uh, how education also should instill culture and the qualities of womanhood uh, uh, must never be compromised. So she had to be virtuous in being able to manage the house uh, successfully, perfectly and also she should be equipped to pass on the correct knowledge of Islam uh, 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 among the family, uh, uh, among the children of the family. So, while the provision of education to women and the regeneration of Islam as a religion uh, had to be carried on together, and uh, various literary and journalistic uh, writings also emerged to reinforce this message. Thank you.
continuing with our discussion, uh, from the late 19th century onwards, the idea of a companionate wife uh, started uh, emerging uh, among both Hindus and Muslim elites. Uh, and women were now uh, to be sympathetic uh, and uh, they had to contribute to the lives and careers of their husbands. And this could only be done if they were well versed not only in uh, the new emerging ideas was, but also English education, English language. And so uh, uh, they had to now uh, adopt new ways and means also in order to partner with their husbands in a more positive way. Uh, as a result, uh, uh, especially amongst the Indian civil servants, there was a trend to climb the bureaucratic ladder uh, through their educated wives who were well educated and who would be able to socialize with British officials. Uh, tracing the history of women's education in India, education in India started receiving some attention uh, under colonial rule with the Charter Act of 1813 and obtained full rec recognition uh, in the Macaulay's Minute of 1835. So the Charter Act of 1813 and then the Macaulay's Minute of 1835 were both important uh, developments as far as devising uh, a colonial education policy was concerned. But even till now, uh, women were considered outside the purview of formal education. So even while colonial administrators were actively pursuing ways and means to bring about a change, uh, the cause of women education was not really uh, uh, the, the prime agenda for them. And it was only when the Woods Dispatch uh, was, uh, came in 1854, uh, which contained educational development program it was passed by the East India Company uh, that a special reference was made uh, uh, to uh, the education and employment of women. This in itself uh, meant that almost 100 years after colonialists uh, were ruling India, the British colonialists set foot in India, 1757, started ruling and almost 100 years later they realized that it was important to talk about women education also, uh, uh, though only as a passing reference. Uh, so uh, the uh, government now assumed direct responsibility of making women literate. Then it's, this in itself was uh, a big change, but then uh, when one comes to evaluate the practical significance of this, uh, uh, very little emerged out of it. English was increasingly being employed as the language of instruction during 1852 to 1853 and various petitions uh, to this effect were sent to the British Parliament in support of both establishing and adequately funding university education in India. This resulted in the Education Dispatch of July 1854. And this was definitely instrumental in shaping the education system in India. Now, come, going back to the progress of women's education in colonial India, which is our topic of the lecture today, uh, there was definitely some progress at primary level, but it was very slow and uh, uh, that too uh, there were many regional anomalies. So it was not as if the entire India was benefiting out of this new thrust on women's education. There were some initiatives that were uh, made towards separate schools for girls uh, and uh, this also was largely the work of Indian philanthropists uh, and very few uh, such initiatives were taken by the British uh, masters. Some women were also imparted training for appointment as teachers in girls' schools, but it is only after 1882 when systemized education data started emerging uh, quinquennially that the progress of women's education came to be assessed and it 
uh, was now becoming more and more clear as to what were the difficulties on the ground and what needed to be done. But the sad reality was that the colonial regime was not ready to spend uh, a lot on the education sector. Their prime focus was definitely military expansion and more and more exploitation of India's by devising newer ways and means, uh, railways, investments in uh, roads in order to uh, join the hinterland with the core. So uh, it, it was, uh, education was always uh, an agenda that could be postponed for some more time to come and particularly women education was uh, not uh, something uh, on which Britishers were going to spend a lot of money. The British believed in education through legislation and therefore they set up the Indian Education Commission called the Hunter Commission in 1882 which recommended the attention of the state should be directed to elementary education and advised the transfer of the control and administration of elementary education to local bodies according to the British system. So even before realizing whether the local bodies in colonial India were ready or fit enough to assume this role, this new additional responsibility was added to them without giving them much power and resources. Uh, so as a part of the British policy, uh, uh, they established a department of public instruction in each province of British India with the aim of expanding education among Indians. Uh, a number of teacher training schools were established for all levels of instruction. There was also an increase in the number of government colleges, vernacular schools and high schools. And uh, uh, the Department of Public Instruction that was set up in 1855 uh, devised various ways and means and strategies to implement the new education system. And by 1857, uh, a number of universities had been established which were modelled on the University of London. This again was a major anomaly of the British education system that they were trying to replicate a system which was completely foreign in origin without giving a thought or an ear to what was being demanded in India. The commission also recommended promotion of female education by giving grants to girls' schools, female teachers and reducing fees for girls. A very important uh, role uh, in this entire process was played by Gopal Krishna Gokhale who moved a bill on compulsory elementary education in 1911 in the Imperial Legislative Council but sadly it was rejected and it was only in 1917 that Vithal Bhai Patel got the first law on compulsory primary education in India passed by the Bombay Education Council. By 1930, almost all the provinces in India had passed a law for primary education, thereby uh, initiating a process which should have started much earlier in a time-bound manner. Many of the rulers of the native uh, uh, states also took uh, initiatives uh, uh, and lot of interest in the subject of education. For example, the state of Baroda was the first to pass a compulsory education enactment for boys uh, in the age group of 7 to 12 years and girls in the age of 7 to 10 years in 1906. So for girls, 10 years, uh, an education till 10 years of age was considered as sufficient and uh, could be considered as state responsibility. Coming to the uh, uh, further development and progress of education, uh, uh, an important uh, milestone was the Hartog Committee. Hartog Committee, which submitted its report in 1929, emphasized on women's education, which stated that Education should not be the privilege 
of one sex only, but equally the right of both the sexes and that women's education would be expanded further for the advancement of overall education in India. The passing of the Government Act of 1919 and the Government of India Act of 1935 gave more power to Indian ministers to act independently and now education also became a provincial subject and a great deal of attention was now being paid to the spread of education particularly at elementary level as well as to the problem of eradicating illiteracy. Now, there are some interesting statistics that are available which would help us gauge as to how much was achieved uh, 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 during this uh, entire period of educational reforms, new education policies, education commissions, etc. So, the male-female combined literacy rate in 1901 was merely 5.9 percent and the female literacy rate was only 0.60 percent. Till the 1941 census, it had increased only up to 7.30 percent, which was a little less than 50 percent of the total literacy rate of 16.10 percent, thereby showing that how huge a gender gap existed during the colonial period and some of this gender gap continues till date. Since 1981, is a, uh, there was uh, some reduction in the gap, definitely uh, a lot of positive uh, changes were coming about after independence and the gap is now less than 50% uh, uh, after 1981. It shows that there is a tendency for the gap to close and as per the 2011 census, the literacy rate for males was 82.14% as compared to females, it was 65.46%, thereby showing a gap of 17% still. Now, uh, if one goes back in history and one looks at a class in progress, you can clearly say, see a higher education uh, class going on and how women, very few women are huddled in a room which is definitely away from the main classrooms so as to maintain some kind of parda and uh, uh, how uh, from the, that inside chamber only they could listen to the lectures that were going on. Now, uh, coming to the idea of basic education as to how this idea developed and progressed, uh, it was during the freedom movement that Mahatma Gandhi formulated the scheme of basic education in 1937. The idea of basic education was very dear to Mahatma Gandhi uh, and this recommended a compulsory universal seven years education in the mother tongue for all children. It was adopted in all the provinces where the Congress ruled under the Government of India Act 1935. A very important role in this was played by the BG Kher Committee, uh, which was set up by the Indian National Congress, which recommended that this goal should be achieved by the year 1970, uh, uh, 1960. Now, the idea of basic education uh, also found its way in Indian constitution. It led to the formulation of Article 45 of the Directive Principles of Indian Constitution and it enjoined that the state shall endeavour to provide within a period of 10 years from the commencement of this constitution for free and compulsory education for all children until they complete the age of 15 years. So, in this new scheme of things, girls were considered as part of the overall uh, category of children and no special strategy was devised to bridge the gap that existed not only in literacy but also in attainment of higher education. Now, uh, coming to the interpretation of this uh, uh, reform process that supported women education, 
uh, we need to discuss briefly uh, the, uh, the historiography that exists and different interpretations that have been developed uh, to explain and to understand the new education system that was being devised and the new drive uh, uh, that was being encouraged to instill education among women. So on the one hand, we have the proactive reform model which, which we would be discussing first. Now according to this model, the most important historiography uh, uh, that linked women education to positive uh, improvement was that this would bring about definite changes in the lives of women and it was considered as a part of the overall uh, project of uh, reformism and positive change that was initiated during 19th century. Proactive reform model kind of uh, wholeheartedly appreciates and supports the various endeavors that were made in the course of 19th, 20th century to bring about changes in the lives of women by allowing them to get educated. It presents women's educational reform movement as a constructive phenomenon that uplifted the condition of women in 19th century and there was no other uh, positive change uh, that could have happened without this essentially. It discusses the efforts to get the women introduced to the western style of thought, philosophy, education, both at the level of homes as well as at the level of schools. And a major stress uh, of the new education since it was on newer subjects and English language, so it was definitely going to broaden their outlook. On the other hand, the other model that has kind of uh, uh, reviewed the reform process and that has kind of questioned the validity of the idea of the greatness of the reform movements of 19th century is the retroactive reform model uh, that was devised by Geraldine Forbes, Tanika Sarkar and Sumit Sarkar. Uh, according to th uh, these historians, by the beginning of the 20 21st century, uh, uh, they uh, kind of uh, uh, developed a critique of the proactive reform historiography and they kind of questioned as to why 19th century reform movements should be projected in the way they have been so far. So these historians have reinterpreted the 19th century reform movements, the education reforms, etc. to present them as retrogressive, as backward, as limiting in many ways. And according to this critique, it did not encourage the women to emerge as independent individuals and that was a major problem of these reforms that has not really been much talked about. Not, uh, they also uh, uh, described these reform movements as uh, not truly a liberating force which would liberate women from their traditional structures but rather again bound them to the homes. In the 19th century, many Europeans saw the Indian society as backward, ignorant and they also kind of declared that it was the grand narrative of the colonial regime to civilize and to modernize the Indian society, particularly because of the ways Indian society treated its women, Indian males misbehaved and exploited its women. And Britishers declared that they are going to do this through rationalism and modernity which would be encouraged through education. The retroactive critical model argues that the reformers of 19th century were mainly involved in responding to this critique of the imperialistic Eurocentric ideology and it was not a conscious attempt by these Indian men to bring about a change in the lives of women. So 
they say that when these educated Indians or these reform minded Indians or these nationalist uh, Indians were supporting demand for education of women, they were kind of trying to save their skin by responding to the critique of the colonial regime, by showing them that they were capable enough of reforming their women, by patronizing schools for them, by supporting education for them, and they did not need an outside agency of the colonial state to do all this for their women. And this was a major problem according to this retroactive model. Also, uh, these historians have pointed out as to how there was a dominance of masculinity in the entire discourse of education, in the entire uh, curriculum of new education policy that was being supported by the Indians. These reforms reflected the changed aspirations and the ideas of femininity of the educated men and not of the women. The women were expected to follow the new norms and standards set by the menfolk rather than evolving their own ideas who were, which were based on their own aspirations, their own goals. And as a result, there was a complete absence of the narrative of women in this entire discourse of reforms. So there was not only a missing woman, but also a missing girl child. A girl child never existed as if in the 19th century, it was only women, it was only femininity and the very playfulness, the very cheerfulness, the very uh, lightheartedness and the creativity, the leisure aspect of being a girl was overlooked uh, in order to groom uh, talented, uh, good looking, well mannered, English educated women. So uh, this all was bound to result in the continuation of masculinity and male dominance in Indian society. This model also argues that the women were expected to become educated and because it was thought that an educated woman would be able to perform a better role in their house as a wife and a mother um, and a more active and a more uh, rigorous routine could also be followed by them which had now become very important with the introduction of clock, with the introduction of knockery which uh, definitely demanded a more regimented kind of a routine and a strict discipline had to be followed by husbands in order to uh, make themselves available into their offices on time. Therefore, according to this model, the reform movements were made as a response to the imperialistic critique from Europe and not as a conscious attempt to modernize women or to make them truly liberated. Now, having discussed uh, the various anomalies that were there and how uh, the education uh, reform movements have been interpreted variously, we would now be discussing as to what happened on the ground, how the regional distribution of educational institutions for women in India took off and which were the areas that benefited the most out of this exercise. So the British had established their presidencies or the power centers along the coastline of India. So they established the Madras presidency in 1640 and the Bombay presidency in 1687 and the Bengal presidency in 1690. They acquired Punjab in 1849 and after the two Anglo-Sikh wars, their control was established. Finally, they shifted their center to Delhi in 1912. So, uh, our next course of discussion would be as to which were the areas that benefited the most from this new emerging paradigm of women education. And we would be discussing this not only uh, in the terms of North, South, East and Western India, but also a number of marginalized areas that not, have not been really looked into. That would be the course of discussion.
in the future lesson. Thanks a lot. With this note, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so very much. And dear friends, we believe that you might have benefited from this lecture. If you have queries, then do write to us at info.cec at nic.in. The lecture is going to be uploaded on YouTube soon. And all the lectures pertaining to the series are there on the YouTube. Do listen to them. And yes, do write to us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you once again. Thank you, Gitika.